Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace. I'm Johnette Williams. On June 24th of this year, the United States Supreme Court overturned the controversial 1973 ruling of Roe v. Wade, which declared that the Right to Privacy Clause of the Constitution protected a woman's right to abortion. Pro-abortion groups and most media outlets responded with a spate of misinformation which worked to incite confusion, angry demonstrations, vandalism, harassment and threats. Our guest today will set the record straight and tell us why the fight for life is far from over and of great importance in upcoming elections. Shockwaves hit the media on June 24th of this year when the United States Supreme Court overturned the 1973 ruling of Roe v. Wade and returned the abortion issue to the states. Angry pundits and special interest groups responded to the June reversal with misinformation that helped fuel confusion, vandalism, harassment, and threats to pro-life agencies, crisis pregnancy centers, and Supreme Court justices as well. With us today are two women who have fought hard for the right to life of children in the womb and whose energies remain devoted to this issue. Dr. Monica Miller is the founder of the pro-life organization Citizens for a Pro-Life Society. She chronicles her experiences in her book, Abandoned, the Untold Stories of the Abortion War, available for you at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Dr. Kathleen Raviel is a recently retired obstetrician gynecologist of 33 years. She has served as president of the Catholic Medical Association and has helped couples both achieve and postpone pregnancy through natural family planning and fertility awareness-based methods. Let's welcome Dr. Monica Miller and Dr. Kathleen Raviel. Ladies, welcome to Women of Grace. I'm so happy you're here today. Yes, thank you, our Janet. honor and our privilege. Well, thank you. And you know, both of you have been guests on the set in the past, and I have been very remiss in not having you in more recent years, <laughs> but I'm delighted that we're here to talk about this most important issue that we're facing today. And I'm not really sure sure if we as a, as a culture, as a people, recognize the serious realities that we're facing, especially as we approach these upcoming elections. And the, the misinformation that's gone out there, and I want to start with you, Kathleen, the misinformation that's gone out there with regard to uh, what abortion is and what abortion isn't um, is rife. And so as a doctor, you know, I know that it must have just made you <laughs> just so upset when you began to hear people saying, well, the right for a woman to have, you know, she'll die with an ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if she has a miscarriage, nothing will be able to be done about it. This is just absolute nonsense isn't it? Absolutely. In a miscarriage, most women, the baby has already died and she starts bleeding and she goes to the doctor or the emergency room. They do an ultrasound. They see the baby has died. They know she will miscarry. If she has to have a DNC to complete the miscarriage, the baby has died. There is no ethical problem. An ectopic pregnancy is a life-threatening problem for the mother. 90% of the time, the baby also has died. But removing the tube with the baby in it, even if the baby is live, does not have any ethical dilemma. So it does not change the health care for women. Even if she has a serious medical problem, we've made so many advances over the last 50 years in caring for women with their medical problems in pregnancy that we can get most women through to the point where both mother and baby will be alive and will thrive. Mm -hmm. This is, this is very personal to me. I, and I actually, I talk about m my first miscarriage mm -hmm. uh, in my book. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's exactly the experience that I had. And the baby died at six, seven weeks into the pregnancy. Uh, and I went into uh, an emergency room. And our, my very pro-life doctor, I don't know if you, I, I, you might know him, uh, uh, Dr. James Lynn. Mm -hmm, L I, I and, and you know Dr. James <laughs> I Lynn. I love that man. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, I and here's the other thing I want to point out. Okay, it's, it, it, you know, to, to turn our attention maybe to Michigan for a second. Michigan has had a law that bans abortion that goes all the way back to the 19th century, mm -hmm. so a, a possibly a, a 160 years, and the law was updated in 1931. So here's what the other side needs to do, or at least we need to point it out to them. From 1931 until the Supreme Court ruling in uh, January of 1973, so a, f a period of about 40 years, that law was in effect. What's the legal history? What's the legal application of the Michigan ban? And it was a ban on abortion except for the life of the mother. So it was, it was very comprehensive. 
No woman was ever prosecuted for getting an illegal abortion under that law, and certainly no woman was denied treatment for an ectopic pregnancy or miscarriage. So those are the facts. That's the history, and we need to point, you know, we need to hammer that home. Yes. Well, and I think that that's one of the problems that we have today. Uh, not only is it misinformation, but it's purposely misconstrued information. Uh, the, 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 the ideology that's driving this agenda is such that it really doesn't matter if you're telling a lie as long as you get the job done. Well, that was, the, that was Roe v. Wade from the start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Roe v. Wade's based on a lie. You know, so, so why not keep lying, you know? But, um, yeah, exa exactly. The, 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 Right, they want to create a sense of panic and fear in the American voter, mm -hmm. and that's those are those that's those are the obstacles that we 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 face as we're going into the November mid midterm election. Mm -hmm. yeah. And back when back when Roe v. Wade was was legalized, there had been a media campaign by Dr. Bernard Nathanson and those who founded the National Association to Repeal Abortion Laws, NARAL, and they, they told people that there were a million illegal abortions every year in this country. There were not. There were 98,000. They said five to 10,000 women died every year from illegal abortions. No, it was 250. They said that 60% of Americans wanted to make abortion legal for any reason, and no, it was less than 1%. But I'll tell you, John, that even now, those who want to promote abortion are still promoting more uh, lies. They want to tell women that they, they won't be able to have health care. They want abortion to be labeled essential health care. <laughs> it is not health care. Yeah, like our Governor Whitmer in Michigan yeah. a, during the COVID uh, lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I'll keep the abortion clinics open, oh. cl close the churches, <laughs> but yes. the liquor stores and the abortion clinics are staying open. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah and, and I mean, this is, this is, this is really the, uh, not only the contradiction of it all, but, but this is the, 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 the lie of it all, right? And I think one of the things that really concerns me as we move forward in time here and and I, I was sharing this with you Monica when we had a conversation earlier that you know my, you go back to 1973 right and I, you know I don't know what the official definition is of a generation mm -hmm. you know how many years that is but you go back and and I'm, I'm gonna say 10 years you know you have children coming of age you know 10 every 10 12 years or so right so the fact of the matter is since that time every person who has come of age has come of age underneath this law that never should have been a law because it's an illegal law because the Supreme Court is not to pass law. That's the legislature's job. I mean, the whole thing is, is exactly what you said. The whole thing is, is, is based on a lie and, and the lie perpetuates. But now, because it's seen as a right, mm -hmm. You know, it's seen as a right. You have these young, uh, you know, millennials and, and, and uh, even, even some that are a little older than that, certainly some younger, you know, that are rising up. You're taking a right away. You have no right to take away my right, but it was never a right to begin with, was well, it? And, and, and the, the, the thing that gets me about the Dobbs decision, uh, and I, I did actually read it. <laughs> All and, 250 and, and pages. And dissenting opinions, yes, exactly. Uh, Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong from the start, mm -hmm. right? Egregiously wrongly decided from the start. And at first you have, you have joy because Roe v. Wade at last is overturned. But then there's a certain reality that sets in. And the reality is egregiously wrongly decided from the start cost us 63 million innocent human beings they, who were exterminated mm -hmm. under a law that shouldn't have been there to begin with. It, it just, it just, you know, kills me. You yes. know, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, not, not, you know, not to make maybe you know, not mixing my metaphors. I mean, I, it's, if it was egregiously wrong from the start, wrong, wrongly decided from the start, it shouldn't have been there in the first place. Mm -hmm. No, it shouldn't have been, but it was. You know, it was, it was wrongly decided. So who's going to say I'm sorry? Apart. It's like, oops, you know. We messed up. Well, yeah, and, and nobody's going to say they're <laughs> sorry. In addition to the to the to what's happened to those babies, which is you say, I mean, it's it's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. And I'm going to ask you to take us through an abortion, doctor, because I think that we need to understand. Uh, you know, th this this is an invisible victim, yeah. right? And so people don't see what happens. But I think we need to understand what that is. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, you know, we've got these women. 
these women, many of them, and most abortions now today, I believe, are, are second or third or fourth or fifth or serial abortions, right? Maybe, I, maybe. maybe. Not a, always. a lot of them, but some yeah, of them are just yeah. one. Yep. Yeah. Well, they carry that with them. As much as, as, as society wants to say that there's no residual effect to the woman who has an abortion, the fact of the matter is, in many cases, the life experiences of those women tell a different tale. And they might not always connect the dots. No, but about, the dots are there. <clears throat> about 17% of women actually suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder from an abortion. And sometimes women will suppress it for so many years that maybe they'll be 55 and something will trigger a depression or a reaction, an overreaction. They may have trouble relating to their other children, trouble relating to their husband, anger with a mother who dragged them off to the abortion mm -hmm. clinic or anger with a boyfriend who dragged them off to the abortion clinic. Many women undergo an abortion because of coercion. Mm -hmm. They felt they had no choice and somebody forced them to have the abortion. And when you think of, there are at least 63 million children who have died from abortion. It's probably at least 15% higher. That's the population of California, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire together. Mm -hmm. The populations today, all those souls that have been lost. And the women, the, the reaction of women, I'm sure, many women, when the Dobbs um, decision came out was, I would never have done that if it hadn't been legal. They yes, told me it was legal, yes, yes. and legal to many people equals moral. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, and, and again, you know, that, the, 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 uh, that misconception mm -hmm. has caused so many things to be done in the name of what we call health care, but right. there is nothing healthy. Uh, there, health is not involved in a, woman's, uh, in a woman having an abortion. There's nothing healthy about that. It mm -hmm. is the antithesis of healthy. It Explain is. why that's so. Well, it's actually very healthy for women to have children. It helps their bones. It helps prevent breast cancer. It makes them better people. They're more unselfish, generous people. But no, abortion is not health care. It actually leads to health problems. There is an increased risk of mental illness when a woman's had an abortion. There is an increased risk of breast cancer if she has an abortion with her first pregnancy. And there is an increased risk of a subsequent premature delivery. We have a record number right. of prematurity in the United States, and a lot of it has to do with abortion. Not all of it, but it's not health care. But, Johnette, things have changed now as a result of COVID with abortions. The, uh, the telemedicine, chemical abortions now, and what President Biden has done through the FDA is that a woman can call a doctor on the internet, get a tell them, get all she has to do is tell the first day of her last period, answer a few questions, and the doctor mails her the drugs to have an abortion. She has no examination, no ultrasound, no testing to see if she's anemic, no testing to see if she's RH negative. Right, exactly, yeah. And so you don't even know if it is that woman. A Rogam shot, yeah. Craig, which I, I'm O negative. <laughs> yeah, if yeah. it is that woman, who is who was requesting the drugs and if she really is that far along in pregnancy that is not health care no. and yet the american college of OBGYN says that's really all you have to do now is is just do this via telemedicine with no visit but why, why I, have, I have to admit i am a little perplexed by that attitude i mean these these are medical professionals who you know they we would assume care about uh, uh, others and they, I don't understand why th there is this cavalier attitude that, I mean, if, they, if, if there's, you know, there's no supervision, there's no regulation, the, dr the drug is mailed to the woman, and, and as far as I understand, um, these uh, chemical abortion drugs shouldn't be, sh shouldn't be administered uh, af after the 10th, the 9th or 10th week of pregnancy. But what if the woman's 15 weeks along, or 16 or 18? I, I, isn't, isn't it life-threatening for her to be taking these drugs if, if she's in, you know, beyond that 10th week? Well, and it's, it's very life-threatening at 9 or 10 weeks. I mean, many of these mm -hmm. women end up in the emergency room. The emergency rooms don't have to report women who come in with complications of abortion. The only thing that has to be reported now is if a woman dies. But women are also being instructed by the abortion doctor that if they go into the emergency room, they should just say they're having a miscarriage. 
So the doctor won't even know. And they can't you tell took the difference. They, they See, can't. You know, we, we have to go to a break, but but just to summarize this um, with with a final statement, but we can come back and pick it up if you want to after the break. But but the fact of the matter is, the, the lies continue to be perpetuated oh, because yes. these women are told that this is safe. There's nothing the matter with this. Most of them have no idea what they're about to experience uh, in, in the loss of this child. Many of them are doing this all by themselves. Yeah. Uh, you, it, the, the horrific reality of delivering a child that you have, they begin to see, see, because when they're in the abortion clinic, they don't see that baby after that baby is dismembered. But mm -hmm. then when they see that baby, when they're doing this chemical abortion, mm -hmm. it's a whole nother matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so, friends, we're, very big topic that we're discussing today, a very important topic that we're discussing today. Uh, we're really trying to th uh, break through that, that web of lies that, that has shrouded this issue. Uh, it's very important. I, I hope that you're paying really close attention because as we come forward in time to the elections coming up, uh, it's very, very necessary that we, we vote properly and we vote for life for all of the reasons that we're discussing today. We're going to be right back more with our guests. Dr. Kathleen Raviel and Dr. Monica Miller. Stay with us. Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guest today. We have with us Dr. Kathleen Raviel. Uh, Dr. Kathleen Raviel is recently retired, an obstetrician gynecologist for 33 years. Uh, she continues to remain on the front lines of, of the right for life uh, for every child that is conceived. Dr. Monica Miller, uh, professor of theology and one who has been engaged in, in this, this abortion war almost since the inception uh, you know, of uh, right around 1973, maybe a couple years after that, Monica, 76. right? 76. So three mm -hmm. years after, she's been a warrior, uh, even even burying 6,000 babies that have been discarded. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous work. She chronicles her experiences in her book, Abandoned, The Untold Story of the Abortion Wars. And, you know, I've read this book. It's a compelling book. It's a page-turning book. It's one of those things where you, you want to find out what happens and yet you, you dread turning the page because of what you're going to read. Mm -hmm. But I think it's absolutely must reading for today. I, you know, and this, was a, this book was very important when you first penned it almost 10 years ago, Monica. It's more important now. So I want to send you out to EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. You can order a copy of this book. And I'm going to tell you, order a copy for all of your friends and all of your family members too. They need to read this book as we approach these upcoming elections. Another fantastic book that Dr. wrote is The Authority of Women in the Catholic Church. Uh, this book is one that we have used in Women of Grace. We've taken our women through a, a beautiful, beautiful educational program with Dr. Monica Miller with regard to who woman is, the power that she has. And let me tell you what, it is a, it, you will be dazzled, ladies, <laughs> when you discover how absolutely marvelous you are and, and the great plan God has in mind for you. So we invite you to get a copy of this book at EWTN's Religious Cal Catalog while you're out there at the same time. Thank you so very much, ladies, for being with us today. I want to get that in there because sometimes we wrap it up right on that last second and I don't get a chance <laughs> to thank you. This is such an important discussion. We were talking about chemical abortions before we went to break. I, I want for you, uh, Dr. Kathleen, to, to walk us through what a clinical abortion or a surgical abortion is, uh, what actually takes place there. And then I want you to uh, compare and contrast that to these chemical abortions. Well, 90% of abortions are done in the first trimester. And 94% of abortions are done because the woman simply doesn't want to have the baby. They're not done because the woman has a health problem or rape or, or, rape or incest or anything like that. So that's important to know. Uh, generally, chemical abortions are taking uh, precedence over surgical abortions, especially because of the laws that have been passed now. But a surgical abortion is the woman is supposed to go to the clinic, have an examination, have an ultrasound, be told about the complications of abortion, and then come back 24 hours later and have what's called a D and E, a, d a dilation and evacuation. So with just some local anesthetic in the cervix and maybe some sedation, the, uh, the physician doing the abortion, although now in New Jersey even a non-physician can do an abortion oh legally, they, they, uh, the doctor dilates the cervix with metal dilators and inserts a long plastic curved tube catheter into the uterus, turns on a suction machine, and it, it ruptures the membranes and basically tears the baby apart and the placenta and the membranes and, and suctions it out. And then when, if the patient isn't having very much bleeding, the, the surgeon decides that it's done. And so the nurse in the room has to piece the baby back together again 
and make sure that they got the skull if, and if, the spine. If, if they do that. Yeah, and the arms and the legs, because if they left some of the baby inside or some of the placenta inside, the woman's going to have an infection. Well, the uterus can get perforated with that, and that uh, you know is uh, is a life-threatening situation for the woman. She can have tremendous bleeding at the time. She can get an infection afterwards, but. Most importantly, the woman has been lying there on the table and has heard that suction machine. Yeah. And again, after Dobbs overturned Roe v. Wade, so many women are going to be saying, oh, I would never have done that. Now I understand what happened. Because the abortionists do understand that they're taking the life of a baby. We've had ultrasound since 1973. They know this is a baby whose heart is beating at five and a half, six weeks. But they've just decided, because this woman doesn't want to have the baby or hasn't been counseled otherwise, that I'm going to eliminate the baby. Well, you know, Stacey Abrams uh, said recently that that sound of the baby's heartbeat is manufactured, that a baby's heartbeat doesn't begin to beat so what, at what six weeks. What does she weeks. mean by manufactured? <laughs> like manufactured the machine sound. that's the, the, the Doppler is making, making the sound? I mean, what is No, what no, well, it there's is. something that there's a, there's a, a, an audio tape or something that's playing that's making that sound. Oh, no, 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 no. But that is what she said. <laughs> no. so, yeah, she's so. never had a baby and gone, gone into her, her uh, gynecologist and, and, and had heard the heartbeat of her child? I, I mean, I have. She, she has not had a baby. There are, you know, there are so many women when they are pregnant, they're so excited when they hear the baby's heart beating the first time. Yes. And, and Dr. Nathanson said when he saw it by ultrasound, he said, oh, Oh, my word, what have I been doing? Well, this is the same Dr. Nathanson that you mentioned earlier yes. on, who was a famous, you know, a, a abortionist. I forget how many abortions he said. Over 100,000, I think he said. No, he, he, 70, he, he, presided. he presided over 75,000. Yeah, he presided over 60,000 in his abortion clinic. He had the largest abortion clinic because New York State uh, legalized right. abortion before the rest of the country. He personally did... Uh, 10,000 or personally did 5,000 abortions and he trained other doctors to do abortions to the number of 10,000 and he in, including he aborted two of his own children yeah. so he said I'm responsible for 75,000 abortions but he was raised Jewish and when he went through this conversion and became pro-life he entered the Catholic Church and was baptized yeah. and all of those sins were washed away mm -hmm. yes and for beauty. everybody out there who was involved in abortion go to confession well, and you know, wash those sins away. Thank you, Kathleen, because I think that this is so very important for, for all of, of our listeners and viewers to, uh, to hear. And that is the fact that there's no sin that's greater than God's mercy. And I know so many of you that have had abortion suffer with this. Mm -hmm. You know, even after going to confession, you know, this, 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 this morbid guilt can cling. Uh, but God does not want that for you. He wants you to know that the sacrament expunges the sin, uh, beginning again, start again, uh, allow the Lord to pick you up and to make you whole. And I think that that has to be proclaimed loudly. Yes. So the purpose of our program here is, is, is not to excoriate women who have fallen victim to the lie or were coerced or uh, of their own volition chose an abortion for whatever reason. The purpose of the program is to inform people what abortion truly is so that we can stop the scourge of, of these lives. Uh, Monica, you say, what was it, 63, 63, 63 million, million lives here? Yeah, in the United exactly. States alone, not to mention throughout the oh. world, and the numbers of women who have had these abortions, some of them uh, many times over, uh, you know, two, three, four, five, six abortions. Uh, the fact of the matter is, we, we want to stop that. You know, we want to stop that, 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 that abuse of the human person on every single level. And, you know, you asked a question when we went to the break, you know, of, of, of Dr. Uh, Monica. You asked her, you know, like, how is it that, that people that are in healthcare, presumably going into this career field and this profession to help people, can stand by and allow this something, travesty something to dangerous continue? To happen. Yeah. yeah, and not and to, to take, mention to the that numbers who have signed on to, to I think, outgrowths of this reality, uh, you know, that has to do with transgenderism and all of these horrible procedures. Let me, let me say something about Bernard Nathanson. Um, in 1982, I attended the Ohio Right to Life Committee convention. And he was there, and this was kind of when he was first coming into, you know, the pro-life movement. He was, at that point, kind of a, a man without a country. And, and the pro-lifers didn't trust him really mm -hmm. yet, okay? And he would isolate himself. I saw him sitting in a restaurant by himself, and he, would, he really didn't want to talk to anybody. And he was very, very secluded um, and, and, and a sense of alienation. 
Um, then I saw him again in 1996 at a Human Life International. And we're going to have to leave oh, a, oh, on a cliffhanger leave here <laughs> because we are out of time, okay. but we will pick up with, we'll that. Pick up with that. So you'll okay. have to watch tomorrow to hear what that genesis was for yes, him and that right, change right. that occurred there. Fascinating story. Thank the both of you. Mm. Thanks to the both of you for your time today. Friends, we want to thank you for watching our program. Remember what we said. The books are available for you at EWTNRC.com. I'm hoping that you're gaining insight and understanding through the course of our time together. God bless you now. Bye-bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace. I'm Johnette Williams. Since 1973, America has been embroiled in a battle over abortion. Embroiled also are those who have fought for life and sacrificed much to see it protected. On June 24th of this year, a victory was won when the United States Supreme Court overturned the controversial Roe v. Wade ruling and returned the abortion decision to the states. But the battle is far from over, both for the protection of the unborn and their mothers, but also for the mindset of the culture that has for 50 years permitted and often extolled the killing of children in the womb. Back with us today are Dr. Monica Miller and Dr. Kathleen Raviel. We'll continue to discuss with them abortion, what it is and what it isn't, and why we should care. Far from being over, the battle to protect the child in the womb continues in spite of the June 24th decision of the years in the, in the auditorium, and there was this glorious smile on his face. <laughs> and he says, oh my God, what? He's a totally different man. Mm -hmm. A totally different man. And I, and, I, and I thought Norma McCorvey, who is the Roe v. Wade of, of you know, is, is, I'm sorry, the Jane Roe of, uh, of you know, Roe v. Wade, also converted to Catholicism. And, um, and, I, and I felt this is the triumph of grace at the end of the 20th century. That's mm -hmm. how I felt. Yes. These, we, got, we had these two great gifts mm -hmm. at the end of the 20th century, the conversion of these people responsible for legalized abortion. Yeah. Well, you know, yesterday we, we had talked a little bit about the fact that the entirety of Roe v. Wade um, really was based on a lie. It was an illegal law <laughs> from its inception. Mm -hmm. uh, there well, was... they passed off Norma as having been raped to, well, this... to make an excuse that she, she needed to get this abortion. And that was a total concoction. Exactly. Exactly. So, so even the story of this woman who is the Roe and Roe v. Wade, Jane Roe. She didn't reveal who she was uh, to the public for many years, I don't mm -hmm. think. But then finally, compelled by what she saw happening, uh, you know, and I think under, you know, a, a certain weight of guilt uh, for participating in this, even though she was, she, she was really she was a pawn, wasn't yes. she? She was a I pawn think in a, a level of chess play. Yeah. And, and, and that brings me to a question for you, uh, Kathleen. I mean, you know, what is it, what is, what is going on here? What is the strategy? Why, why, you know, can you even answer why the medical profession, you know, who at one point in time took the Hippocratic Oath, right, to do no harm, to uphold life, to do everything for the health and the well-being of the patient, would enter into such a, a, a I think, a, a macabre reality and reversal of all that is good, true, and beautiful. I mean, really turning its back onto the fundamental reality of why the healing professions are the healing professions. Well, except in rare instances, most medical schools dropped the Hippocratic Oath mm -hmm. in 1973. But well, the, they would have had to. <clears throat> they would have had to because they would have been lying. But, you know, um, there are very few physicians who are actually directly involved in abortion. Uh, the Guttmacher Institute did a study in 2017, and they looked at the number of OBGYNs. They did a survey, number of OBGYNs who had done abortions in a two-year period, and it was only 7% of the OBGYNs in the United States. And 35% of OBGYNs won't refer for an abortion. So there are already a lot of doctors not involved, but the problem is the, the official organizations of obstetrics and gynecology, the American College, the American Board, you know, many of those uh, academics are also serving on Planned Parenthood boards, and they support abortion. They've never actually asked the, their membership how many of them support abortion. But the, what they want to do is they want to eliminate the Hyde Amendment, which is what prevents uh, abortion bills, uh, apportionment bills for uh, taxes and all that, so that we're not covering abortion out of our tax money. They want to uh, make Medicare, Medicaid, and all the private insurance companies cover abortion. They want uh, to stop parental consent 
and parental uh, notification if a minor is coming in for an abortion. They want to, they want to stop the laws that are uh, making the abortion clinics live up to the same standards as a surgical center. They want to make abortion essential health care, even in Catholic you know, institutions. So they're doing all these things to continue to promote abortion. But abortion is not health care. And unfortunately, there's kind of, we have 50 years of legalized abortion that we have to turn the ship around and convince both doctors and, and women and men that abortion is not an alternative to an unplanned pregnancy. It's a crisis pregnancy center. It's women, you know, uh, it's walking with moms in need, the Catholic Church has. It's whatever your local parish or your local church is that can help you. Yeah, well, recently Elizabeth Warren and, and many of her, you know, um, far left cohorts um, have signed a document bringing crisis pregnancy centers uh, under, uh, you know, a spotlight saying that they, they are doing heinous things with the records of these women, <laughs> which is absolutely not true. Uh, again, you know, what we see here is just a, you know, what, 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 what are the heinous things? What are they doing with these records? Well, they're selling, what, they're saying that they're, they're gathering the medical information of women and then they're, they're using it. They, no, doctor's which, offices gather medical information exactly. on people all the time. I was a volunteer medical director for a crisis pregnancy center for 10 years. All of that was kept according to HIPAA compliance, locked up in cabinets, That's right. you know, and all that. So, but it's actually Planned Parenthood that you have to look at on whether they're keeping information secret. And they actually are even providing transgender care to girls today. Yes. Well, see, and that's and providing them with hormones. And that's that, that's a whole nother bailiwick. And I think mm -hmm. that I'm going to have to have the two of you come back to talk about that, uh, because again, you know, we, th this is not health care. No. <laughs> this is not mental health care. <laughs> you know, this is we're living in a delusionary world so today. Surgically remove completely healthy body parts. I'm sorry, that is not health care. No. Mutilation. Yes. It's mutilation. It is mutilation. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. And there, mm -hmm. and you know, you mm -hmm. both know that there's absolutely no way that you can make a woman a man or a man a woman. There is no way to do it. The DNA down to the smallest cell will always tell the truth of who you are. Well, <laughs> so. well the other thing is, you know, for this, the, for the transition, for, for let's say um, a man wants to transition into being female. What actually happens there is it's a, it's a cosmetic uh, transition more, more than anything else because it's almost as if like for example, Bruce Jenner. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think his he had a photograph of him looking like a woman on Vanity, the cover of Vanity Fair. Um, what's he really doing? Is he is feeding into a certain stereotype? So it's not that they become female, but they but they take on a stereotype of what it means to be female, right? Uh, vo voluptuous and beautiful and, and glamorous and all of that. Where there's there's a there's a wide spectrum here, folks, on what a girl looks like. <laughs> you know that he doesn't make himself look you know you know look like an ugly woman, right? Or a short woman or a fat woman. You know what I'm saying? It's just, it, and and really that's something that the feminist movement really needs to say. Hold, let's hold let's hold the phone here. Well, yeah. and there's and there's there's an outcry I think from people for them to do that, uh, especially when it comes to sports, and we've seen all of that. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I want to get back to a statement that you made, Dr. Raviel, and I, I want to see what you want to, what you can contribute to this, Monica, from your you know your theological and philosophical background. And you said we have to turn the ship around. Uh, you know, this ship has been going in a certain direction for 50 years, and you know, uh, oftentimes when if you have a great big ocean liner out there on the open seas or you have a naval vessel you can't make a an overly sharp turn it'll capsize right mm -hmm. um, so we can anticipate that there's going to be we want it all gone right away mm -hmm. but the fact of the matter is I think that we're going to have to be satisfied with a certain incremental approach to moving things around which is not the preference because it could be done in a moment but when we look at it, we, you know, we're talking about changing mindsets and a right. worldview, and we've we've ingrained a worldview from from children's earliest, you know, earliest moments, you know, they've been indoctrinated with well, certain ideas here, well, here's, about here's, all of these things that we're discussing today, all the way up through college. Yeah, the, the issue here is okay. So, in fact, I wrote an article for Crisis Magazine on, on really this very specific point. Okay, and I think the article is entitled um, Roe Overturned, The Joy, The Sorrow, and What Else Needs to Be Overturned. Okay, so you can overturn the, the, the ruling of Roe v. Wade, but my argument in, is 
that you, we have yet to overturn the philosophy right. of Roe versus That's Wade. That's right. Okay? Because right. I, I argue Roe v. Wade is not just a Supreme Court ruling. Ro, Roe v. Wade is a philosophy. Yes. And, and, and that still is uh, pervasive. The philosophy is entrenched. Um, the, the idea that um, it's the woman who stands alone, and I, and I argue that Roe v. Wade invented this thing called the autonomous woman, the woman who is radically isolated. Because look, she, the, the, the right to privacy, okay, the right, is, a, is, a, is a sphere, a bubble zone around one singular individual, who now, isolated from her parents, her boyfriend, even her husband, now in her bubble zone of isolation, she can make a life and death decision over another human being. She, mm -hmm. And she has to be, and, and, and it it's the power. It, 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 exactly what it is, it's power. And that's the thing that they will not, they, that, that, that's the thing we have to convince people about. The, the, this is a uh, corrupted kind of power. P the, uh, sheer power over another. Um, and, and, and here's the other thing that, uh, that, that I think we need to um, take note of. And maybe you know the other the other side you know needs needs to be confronted by this. You know how many how many of these actresses? Even just yesterday, I was reading some article about some actress who said, "If I didn't abort my baby when I was 15 years old, I wouldn't have the life that I have now and the career that I have now, and so on and so forth." And I'm saying to myself, what, what, all, "When all is said and done, what you're really saying is that your physical biology is against you." holds you back, innately holds you back. And, and, and more, that is the radical feminist philosophy. And, and Exactly. My nature, my feminine nature is against me. And what a man has by his nature, I must achieve by art. Mm. Right. And, and the art is contraception and, and abortion. So this woman in, in her radical bubble zone of isolation, um, the, autonom the, autonomous, the autonomous woman. So that's that's and, and basically you're saying the the woman is saying I have to kill something even if you want to say it's a human being, but I have to kill something in order to be liberated. You're 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 right there. You have to own that because basically what you're saying is there's something wrong about being female. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean it, it's killing a living being. Whether you want to recognize it and call it a human being well, is it, a whole it, other matter. Right. But the fact of the matter you're is killing you killing something. You, have to, you have to be a killer. <laughs> so, you you know, have to be a killer yeah. in order to be uh, and, f liberated and free and 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 engage this you know self determination. Well, I, I want to pick up on that um, because I think that that, that that brings us to another reality, which again is another lie that has been trumpeted by that that ilk, uh, you know, the pro-death ilk. Uh, but we got to go to a break, so we're going to come right back, friends. More with our guest today, Dr. Kathleen Raviel, Dr. Monica Miller, sending you out to EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. Love to call it the home of holy reminders in memory of our mother Angelica. Uh, abandoned, the untold story of the abortion wars is available for you there. This is a tremendous book, a tremendous read. It's a must read. I want to tell you that I interviewed Monica on this book back in 2013 and uh, we have taken those programs and made them available for you on our website at womenofgrace.com. So you can go out there and you can watch them. I just watched all five of them, Monica, oh. yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I watched all five of them. I got to tell you what, I, they, they were... They, I must say, those shows were absolutely fantastic, and that was because of you. Uh, so I do want you to get out there and have an opportunity to watch those programs. We're going to be right back. Stay with us. But you know, women... Welcome back, friends. We're visiting with our guests today, Dr. Kathleen Raviel and Dr. Monica Miller. Uh, prior to the break, I was sending you out to EWTN's religious catalog to get a copy of Monica's book, Abandon the Untold Story of the Abortion Wars. And I do want you to get a copy of this book. It's a, it's a, a must read as far as I'm concerned. You really have to read this book. Another one that I want you ladies to get, and you know what, you gentlemen too. This is a really good book for you guys to read. It is called The Authority of Women in the Church. Uh, and Monica explains in here what authority truly is. We were talking about 
power a moment ago. Mm, yeah. uh, that's the way that we look at authority. Yeah. But authority has a wholly different meaning uh, in the in the eyes of God, and really a philosophically different meaning. So we invite you to get a copy of this book as well. You know, we went to the break, and I just I want to say this again. You know, whenever we talk about these issues, we're very aware of the fact that there's numbers of individuals who have fallen victim to the the argument today of of privacy rights with regard to a child in the womb. And if you have made uh, a decision to abort a baby, I, I want you to know that God's mercy is great, uh, that there is no sin that is greater than that mercy. Our point here is not to make you feel bad or for you to feel morbid grief or anything of that nature. But we have to speak the truth here because we can't continue to go on in this way. We can't continue to lose another 63 million people in the United States of America. And so it is for that reason that we talk about these hard realities. So the point is not to offend you or to cause you any kind of consternation. It might be to propel you to the sacrament of confession uh, and certainly maybe to change the way in which you're looking at the world in this issue. Uh, but, but we understand how difficult it can be in very tense moments. So there you have that. I, I wanted to talk with you a moment, though, uh, Kathleen, from, from, a, from a biological, scientific, obstetrician, gynecologist point of view here. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think really is, is a burr in my saddle when I'm listening to these arguments uh, being made is, you know, it's my body. I can do with my body what I want. But that body growing inside of a woman's womb is not the woman's body. No, she's it is not. She's not doing anything to her body. She's not killing her body. There's a beautiful scientific document by Dr. Maureen Kondik, C-O-N-D-I-C. It's on the Charlotte Lozier website now. Mm -hmm. And she goes through biologically when human life begins. And it's called, When Does Human Life Begin? There is a particular instant of sperm from the father and egg from the mother fusion, where biologically after that, this is a separate human being with a separate development, all the, all the different organizational skills that a separate human being has. The, the, the mother and the child are separate. They interface through the placenta and the decidua of, between the mother and the child, so the mother can provide oxygen and nutrients for the baby, but the baby is separate. But you know, we have to go back to the basics about who, who we are as human persons. Mm -hmm. We're all made in the likeness and mm -hmm. image of God. We are a reflection of God in this world. And motherhood is a very special gift. Yes. Motherhood can bring us to heaven. <laughs> I mean, with what mothers have to put up with, with crying babies in the middle of the night and children throwing up on the carpet <laughs> and children misbehaving they as don't, teenagers. They don't do that. <laughs> children misbehaving as teenagers and, and all that type of thing. That sanctifies women. Yes. And so we should not be afraid to have children. And we should, we should look on motherhood as a gift. But children also have the right to have a mother and a father who are, who are committed to each other for life and marriage. And our culture has gotten away that sexual relations is recreation. It's owed to you. It's not your right. You don't have the right until you're married. Yes. And that's the best way to bring up children is within a marriage. That's not always possible. We certainly want children to live. But the best way is to bring them up in a marriage. Yeah, you know, and it's it's beautiful reality. I always felt like to go back to Genesis, you know, and Genesis two especially. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it, you know, if you look at the way in which creation itself was orchestrated, you know, God begins by separating things, right? And He's creating a habitat for man, and He creates man in His image, in the divine image. He created him male and female. He created them. It says in in uh, Genesis one, but in two, we find that the last person to be created is the woman, and she is the she. Is is the masterpiece of God's creation, and everything about her says that. I mean, it, it, you know, I, I, in, in some ways, well, you know, I, that, I, I love the fact that you, you have a bird's eye view of something that we don't, and an appreciation for something that we can't uh, fully apprehend. Uh, when you look at the the construction of the female body and her reproductive system, this is a finely tuned mm. reality that is amazing. It's How like an orchestra the, going it, on every month in the ovaries. I know, I know, and it's a beautiful thing. So we as women <clears throat> should, should find a dignity, you know, Absolutely. sitting up very tall Absolutely. in a marvelous way in which we're created. Well, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, I, uh, the woman is the center of human communion. Mm -hmm. she, she brings the man into her, her orbit, if you, if you will, 
Uh, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cling, which is an instructive word, cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It is not good for the man to be alone. So we know that isolation and alienation is the antithesis of authentic human living. And so really the, tr the truth about women as the center of human communion is, the, is, is absolutely contrary to Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade is the undoing of human communion. Mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade treats, looks at the world and sees radical individualism. And I, we, are not, we are not morally united to each other. Mm -hmm. We are separated. Mm -hmm. the, only, the only reason why I, I, I'm uh, united to you is if I choose to be. Mm -hmm. Not because you're, we have some sort of innate unity based on our humanity. And that's, it's, it, it's dangerous. It's, it, it's, 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 a, it's a corrupted, dangerous philosophy. Well, it is. And, and you know, and I, I want to say something. Uh, I think that this, this split, and, and I think that we, we've talked about this. I think you mentioned it, Kathleen. I'm sure you mentioned it too, Monica. You know, when, when, uh, when you take the sexual act outside of marriage and when you divorce it from its ultimate purpose which is procreation then what happens is you begin to set up a construct for that isolation mm -hmm. and that individualism and I would say that, that you know ultimately you have to go back I mean d divorce was really not something that was embraced by the churches until the 1930s right I think it was the Lambert uh, the contraception, contraception. Con uh, yeah, excuse me the contraception yeah. church, right 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 so divorce was was, was frowned upon uh, as a society because of the need to keep mother and father together for the sake of the children. Uh, but then contraception uh, was really, I think, the, the, the first nail in the coffin. Mm -hmm. And now you take it from there, you can see a, a, a continuity, uh, you know, all the way to the transgenderism that, mm -hmm. that we're seeing. Uh, today and so I'm just going to ask the two of you we have 45 seconds so <laughs> I'm going to ask if you'll come back and, and we can do some additional programs on this topic we need to explore mm -hmm. it more mm -hmm. and I'd like to get into this whole business of transgenderism and mm -hmm. uh, you know the 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 ongoing what do I want to call it de-evolution yes. of 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 man right. I mean you could write it book title like that, Monica, mm. Kathleen, <laughs> two of you could consult. Here, I'll set that up for you. <laughs> all of that being said, thank you so much for being our guest on this very, very important topic. And friends, we want you to take all of what you've heard and apply that uh, as you're looking forward to the upcoming elections. They're outrageously important. God bless you now. Bye-bye.